All right, you guys, we're going to start with um, section 8-1. We're going to go through that. That's the PowerPoint that you should have um, copied down in class yesterday. And then tonight your homework is going to be to do page 52, the DLCE. Remember, that means draw, label, color, and explain. And I'm going to show you a diagram that you can use for your DLCE that's in the PowerPoint here today. It would really be beneficial to you to also write down as much as you can on the Cornell notes for 8-2 onto page 55 so that we can go through it a lot more quickly tomorrow. That will leave us class time um, on Thursday to do a lab. So um, that's what we're headed to. All right, opening up our PowerPoint here. Why do you think this is a, this starts off with a picture of a leaf with a grasshopper on it. What do you think that connection could be? What connection do you make? I saw some hands back here. You guys made it. Why do you think there's a leaf and a grasshopper? You guys put your hands up and then you took it back down. Yeah? Okay, but then why is there a grasshopper there? Oh, the grasshopper gets its energy by eating the plant. So there's a connection between photosynthesis. And then what's that other energy process that we're talking about? Um, um, cellular, respiration. cellular respiration. And so the first big thing that I want to make sure that I hit in this lecture is we're going to be using some abbreviations. PS, obviously, for photosynthesis. CR for cellular respiration. And a capital E is always going to be used for energy. This is going to help you with your note taking. You shouldn't be going ahead of me. Just work right along with me and add to your notes. You should already have these notes written down, okay? That way that you're listening and processing what we're talking about as we're talking about it. So what process does a leaf do? Photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So plants do photosynthesis and cellular respiration. What about animals? Just cellular respiration. Just cellular respiration. So you're hopefully remembering this from the quiz yesterday? Yeah. Yes. This is a hugely important concept and one that is often messed up and missed or misunderstood. You guys have it down that animals, um, that plants do photosynthesis for sure and animals do not. But please keep in mind that plants have to do cellular respiration as well as photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the way in which plants make their energy, make their glucose that they use for energy. Um, cellular respiration is how we get the energy out of the glucose molecules. So going way, way back, remembering the macromolecule bead lab. Do you guys remember the bead lab? I do. You do. And as I graded that, it became really obvious to me that a huge number of you really didn't understand why we did that lab. In that lab, let me refresh your memory. This was before I came back when I was still out with my broken ankle. But in that lab, we took different colors of beads and we use beads and pipe cleaners to build molecules. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Do you remember, what did the beads represent? Um, okay, the beads in that lab represented, represented the elements. And we had different colors of beads, didn't we? And we designated, you know, the, the yellow ones meant, you know, this molecule. We had, we had nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, right? Does that sound familiar? And hydrogen? Then what did we use the pipe cleaners to represent? Um, bonds. The chemical bonds. Good. And so we first started off by building a water molecule, right? And it doesn't matter what shape or what color were used for the, um, the hydrogen and the oxygen. And then we built, so we built water. 
And then we built glucose. And that was C6H12O6. And that was a pretty big molecule, right? It had six carbons in it. Does that sound familiar? And there's hydrogens and the carbons formed like a chain. That's not a very good drawing, is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. And there were carbons and hydrogens coming off of each one of those things, right? And then we broke, broke it all apart and we had a pile of beads. Why, the lab discussed what happens to you if you don't eat a nutritional diet. Why, what happens to you if you don't get, well, let me backtrack first. So we, we built the glucose, we built the water, and then we broke the glucose apart, and we used that to build an amino acid. Do you remember? Yes. I think it asked you to build serine. And then it said, okay, now build another amino acid. And then what happened? You couldn't build a second amino acid. Do you remember why? You didn't have enough beads, literally. You didn't have enough beads, which represented you didn't have the elements, the building blocks that you needed. And then there were questions on the lab about, well, now that you understand this about the lab, what, is this, what does this have to do with eating you know, malnutrition and having a, a, a balanced diet? And 95% of you could not answer that question. See, it was taking what you had learned in that lab and applying it to a new situation. So now, let's think about it. We could build one amino acid, but then amino acid number two, we couldn't build it because we ran out of beads. And beads represent elements. And where did we get those elements into our body? Energy. From food. Well, if you don't eat a proper diet, are you getting all of your raw materials? No. no. So if you don't get the food that you need, you don't get the building block elements, which means you can't build the molecules you need. Does that, under, does that hit home? right? You can't be working on your notes or something else and getting this. So the focus of the macromolecule bead lab that we did way back in August, before I was even here, the point of that lab was getting the building blocks. The point of that lab focused on the beads. Do you understand that? Now we're going to pay attention to the pipe cleaners. Now we're going to pay attention to the chemical bonds that connect the beads to each other. Because those chemical bonds, that's all about energy. And what we're looking at is why does a plant do photosynthesis? And how does this process, how does photosynthesis give a plant energy? Where does the energy come from in photosynthesis? The sun. So we have sunlight energy, but is that all a plant needs to do photosynthesis? No. What else is needed? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and water, and sunlight, and a really important pigment called chlorophyll, which is located inside of a chloroplast, right? And what gets produced? Um, oxygen. Oxygen. And sugar. And sugar. 
So again, there's that glucose molecule. Can you remember kind of what your glucose molecule looked like with the beads, right? It was a ring. It had beads. And then one came off the top. And then it had, it was kind of hard to in visualize, but it was that really big thing that you built on your counter. And you took a picture of it. You might still have a picture of it on your phone somewhere. Sure. And we took it apart and we paid attention to what happened to all those carbons. We didn't even worry about the pipe cleaners. Hmm. Looking at this equation here, where do these carbons come from? In this equation here, the carbons here, where did they come from? Look at the equation. The carbons in glucose, where did they come from? The carbon dioxide. Where do you find this carbon dioxide? In the air. In the air. Where did the hydrogens come from? The water molecule. Are you guys looking at this equation? Yeah. And the oxygens come from oxygen and water and oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, where's the water that a plant gets? Where does the plant get the water from? The ground, from the soil. So the oxygen that a plant exhales goes into the atmosphere. But the carbons, the hydrogens, and the oxygens that are in the glucose molecule come from the air. So why does a plant do photosynthesis? To get energy. Ultimately to get energy. How does the process of photosynthesis give a plant energy? How? Makes it out of thin air and some water. You guys are sleepy, sleepy. Okay. It's Tuesday, yes, I know. Okay, yes, ma'am? No. Okay. This is the whole point, you guys. This is the whole point of why we're talking about photosynthesis. It's the, it's the why. We all know that a plant does photosynthesis to get energy. It can't use the sunlight directly. The sunlight shining on the leaves is not in a form that the plant can eat. It can't eat that energy. So what does it make? Sugars. Do you understand that? So it's converting energy from one form into another. It's taking energy from this sunlight and these other raw materials and putting it into a molecule, glucose, that it can then use. Where is the energy in the glucose molecule? Where is the energy held in the glucose molecule? Is it in the carbons and the hydrogens and the oxygens? Is it? It is. What part, if I'm telling you that the glucose molecule is the energy molecule and the plant is going to use that for energy, where's the energy located? It's, the glucose molecule is manufactured in the chloroplast, but it doesn't stay there. Where does the glucose molecule go? So the glucose molecules are made in the chloroplast. But where are they broken down? Which organelle is responsible for energy production in the cell? The mitochondria. Haven't we studied cells in those organelles before? And the definition of the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It takes in glucose, and what does it do to it? It breaks down glucose. 
breaks down sugars, specifically glucose. When I say glucose is broken down, what does that mean? What does that mean, literally? What are we breaking? The chemical bonds. Remember I said now we're going to pay attention to the pipe cleaners? Right? There's your ring structure. We're not worried about the beads right now. Now we're talking about the pipe cleaners. Didn't I say that at the beginning? Yeah. Yes. We're talking about what happens with the pipe cleaners. Where did the energy come from to build the glucose molecule during photosynthesis? Sunlight. Sunlight. Very good. Did you all hear that? The energy from sunlight and these raw materials were used to make the glucose. So if you don't water a plant, can it do photosynthesis? No. no. Why? Why does it need water? Uh, for the hydrogen and the oxygen. For the hydrogen and the oxygens. It literally doesn't have its building blocks. It's like, why can't you make the second amino acid in the bead lab? Because you don't have enough of the beads. You don't have the raw materials. If you leave a plant in the dark, can it do photosynthesis? No. No, because what is it missing? Sunlight. Sunlight. Energy. Right? Yes. Yes. Sorry. It's missing the energy. So a plant, when it does photosynthesis, takes the sunlight energy, and it turns it from sunlight energy into what type of energy? Chemical bond energy. Do you see that? Yes. Where do you get the carbons, the hydrogens, and oxygens? From the, from the carbon dioxide in the air and the water from in the soil. You get the energy from the, sun. from the sun. And the plant can't hold on to sunlight energy in that form, so it has to convert it into something it can store, and that's glucose molecules. Is this making a little bit more sense? Because most of you are not writing down anything. So why does a plant do photosynthesis? So to convert sunlight energy into glucose, a usable form of energy that it can store. How does it give a plant energy? Well, then it takes that glucose, and later, what does it do with it? Sends it to the mitochondria, where the glucose molecules can be broken down. And that leads us into our topic today, because glucose is a very, very large molecule. It has a lot of chemical bonds. Therefore, it must have a lot of stored energy. The larger the molecule, the more chemical bonds, the more stored energy, right? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So we have to have a temporary way to keep energy stored in, in a chemical molecule, and that's called ATP, and that's what your notes are about. Oh. So this is totally review, right? That living things need energy in order to survive. This is a characteristic of life. And this energy comes from the food that we eat. We covered this when we talked about the macromolecule bead lab. But again, we were paying attention to the building blocks, the beads. We really weren't paying attention to what happened with the pipe cleaners. We didn't really even talk about the pipe cleaners. But every time you stuck two beads together, you, it took energy. To make a chemical bond, energy is required. Mm -hmm. So you guys all talked about why do we need to eat properly. You're like, well, we need energy. And if you don't eat, you won't get energy. But you forgot the building block part of it. 
So you were talking all about energy, but the focus of our lab was really building blocks. We were paying more attention to the bees. So you know the answer to this next question, where do plants get the energy they need to produce food? Sun. The sun. Now, can all things make energy from sunlight or, tra or trap energy? No. So we have two categories of living things on our planet, autotrophs and heterotrophs. Auto means self. Troph means feeding. So the word autotroph literally means self-feeding, okay? Does anybody know what hetero means? Other. So are you an autotroph or a heterotroph? Do you make your own food out in the sun or do you have to eat other things? You have to eat other things. So you guys are all, we are all heterotrophs. Heterotrophs. We eat other things. Organisms such as animals that must obtain energy from food are all heterotrophs. Now, we can eat at different levels of the food chain. You guys know that word, right? Food chain. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I look at the plant gets eaten by the mouse, which get e gets eaten by the owl, that's one food chain. If I look at the plant gets eaten by the mouse, which gets eaten by the snake, which gets eaten by the kite, which is a, like a predatory bird, that's another food chain, right? And all the food chains in one ecosystem, we call that the food web. Are you part of a food chain? We are. Yes. When you eat um, a hamburger, you're eating cow that ate grass, okay? When you eat tuna fish, you're eating a tuna which ate smaller fish, which each ate smaller fish, which then ate algae in the ocean, and that was your producer level, okay? So we can eat at different levels on the food chain. If you look here at um, the plant, then the mouse, then the rabbit, then the wildcat, which eat, gets eaten by the lion, you have several more layers, layers to that food chain, right? And everybody, as we go up the food chain, gets a little bit less energy. So the longer the food chain, the less there is for that top predator. Chemical energy. Now we're going to talk about chemical energy. Energy comes in many different forms, light, heat, and electricity. And it can be stored in chemical compounds. So here's a molecule, and it doesn't matter what that molecule is, but there's a molecule. And what do the circles represent here? Um, the, the elements. The elements. So what do the lines represent? The bonds. The bonds. So, energy is stored where in a chemical compound? In the elements. Not in the elements. In the chemical bonds. So, I need you to put a big star by that because I'm sure that you wrote that sentence down. Mm -hmm. Energy can be stored in chemical compounds. And specifically, I want you to know that it's in the chemical bonds, the covalent bonds that are between the elements, the pipe cleaners. Does that mean that the elements aren't important? No. It just means that the molecule as a whole is important. The elements get rearranged to build other things. Does your body use the carbons and the hydrogens and the oxygens that are in the glucose molecule to do other things in your body? Absolutely. But the energy that was held in the chemical bond that kept them together, that energy gets liberated. It gets freed when you break the chemical bond. So we need to look at how does the body trap it and use it. 
Glucose has way too much energy in it. So your body has to take and break down glucose and put it into smaller packets, smaller par parcels that it can use as it needs. Otherwise, it would be wasting a lot of energy. So we have this molecule ATP. This molecule ATP is used to store, that means to hold on to and to release energy. Where do you think ATP is storing the energy? In the bonds. So look at your notes. What things make up ATP? It should be in your notes. Yes? Adenine, ribose, and three phosphates. Ribose is a sugar. Maybe you remember it from RNA, ribonucleic acid. Adenine is a nitrogen base. Maybe you remember that from the DNA molecule, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. If you didn't write down your notes yesterday, are you writing down your notes today? Because yeah. I'm watching some of you totally off track, off topic. This is totally new information for you, isn't it? Yes. This is something you've never heard of before. This may be the very first time you're hearing about ATP. Yet some of you are just everywhere but here. And I know as my six period class listens to this video in an hour, they're gonna be going, oh my gosh, yeah, we're off track too. Come back six period, pay attention. <laughs> this is important stuff, isn't it? Yes, kind of complicated. But you guys understand that this unit is all about what happens to the pipe cleaners. And how do we rearrange all those molecules? Why do we have to have ATP? Because glucose is too big, it has too much energy. It would be wasteful if we needed energy, just a little bit of energy to break apart a glucose molecule and then waste all the rest of it. So we have to break apart that large glucose molecule and make a bunch of smaller units of ATP. So this is basically what ATP looks like. And it's the three phosphates that are on the ribose that are so important for ATP. This is where we're gonna look at the energy, the bond energy. This is the diagram that I'm recommending that you use for your notebook tonight. You're not gonna write it down now. You can go and look at this presentation online tonight, but let's talk about it. So it says here really nicely, the three phosphate groups are the key to ATP's ability to store and release energy. And it's not the phosphate itself, it's what about the phosphate? It's the chemical bond that connects the phosphates. So don't forget, it's the chemical bond energy. What's the difference between ATP and ADP? Look at the picture. What's the difference between ATP and ADP? What do you see? One has energy and one doesn't. One has energy and one doesn't, okay. One has three phosphate groups. Oh, one has three phosphate groups and the other one only has two. This is a little sketch of a, what do you think this is here? It's supposed to represent battery. a battery. And this battery, I would say, is fully charged. What about this battery here? It's, it's, got, it's, it's a lot less charged, right? It's empty. And then notice these arrows. 
meaning that you can go back and forth. Are you familiar with something that has a rechargeable battery in it? Yes. What? Your phone. It's got a rechargeable battery in it, right? When you plug your phone in to the charger, it's using electricity energy to charge up your battery. Here, how do you charge up this battery? You have to glue a phosphate on. How, what is required in order to glue the phosphate on? Some energy. So if you have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and you give it some energy and an extra phosphate group, you can turn it into ATP. That's cellular respiration, right? That's what happens in the process of cellular respiration. Where does this process occur? In your body. Where in your body, where in your cells, what organelle is responsible for making ATP? The mitochondria. The mitochondria. Where did the energy come from though to put on the phosphate? Where did this energy come from? Food, think smaller than food, think more specific than food. Think about what gets broken down in the mitochondria. Glucose, Glucose thank you. Glucose gets broken down and that's the energy that we get to form ATP. Is this starting to like come together at all? Yeah. No? So why does a plant do photosynthesis? It needs to make what? Glucose. glucose. Why does it have to make its glucose? Because that's what it needs to break down in the mitochondria during the process of respiration so that it can make ATP so that it can do cell processes. The cell can't use sunlight to do cell processes. The cell can't use carbon dioxide or water to do its cell processes. It can't use glucose to do its cell processes. It has to have ATP. So it's constantly transferring energy from one form to another to get it to its most, its form that it can use. Make sense? Question? No? Where does ATP store its energy? In the chemical bonds. The chemical bonds between the, which groups? No. Where does ATP? Between the phosphate groups. Okay. See that little, there's a whole lot of writing on this page, isn't there? Okay. So this, this is, oops, I'm sorry. This is the energy bond here. Okay, the energy bond is between the phosphate groups. So your cells are constantly taking ATP, pulling off phosphate, using that energy to do a cell process. The mitochondria is constantly taking the ADP and those free phosphates, sticking them back together as fast as it can, pumping out ATP to be used other places in the cell. Guess what? It said right here that ATP energy is released when that bond is broken. You guys wrote that in your notes. But you're just doing your notes to get them done. You're not thinking about them, are you? Are you actually even reading and trying to understand what you're writing down? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so energy stored in ATP is released by breaking a chemical bond between the second and the third phosphates. So how, what do we need to glue the phosphate back on? What would we need? Energy. Energy, energy would be need, needed to glue it back on. Why is ATP important for cellular activities? You wrote this in your notes, didn't you? For everything in the cell. 
Cells have to do active transport. Do you remember penocytosis and phagocytosis when the cell does Pac-Man? When the cell has to move stuff against a concentration gradient, when the cell wants to build a protein, when a cell wants to do anything, it takes energy. <coughs> so the energy currency of the cell is the ATP. Better? Yes. So we're not talking about the beads in this chapter. We're talking about the pipe cleaners. We're talking about where that energy came from to connect all those elements together and what happens to the energy, Daniel. When we break apart the molecules. Cells don't keep a whole lot of ATP around. Just a little bit. Because it can be made very quickly in the mitochondria. If a cell had a whole bunch of mitochondria, what would you think about that cell? Gosh, it must need a whole lot of ATP, a whole lot of energy. So if I tell you that brain cells and muscle cells have lots and lots of mitochondria, then they must use lots and lots of glucose. They must have lots and lots of energy needs. Okay, so let's see how you do. Organisms that make their own food are called autotrophs. Most autotrophs obtain their energy from sunlight. How is energy released from ATP? A phosphate is removed. When I say a phosphate is removed, what do we really mean? The chemical bond is broken. And in order to put that chemical bond back, energy is required. How is it possible for most cells to function with only a small amount of ATP? Well, I just told you about two cells that use a whole lot of energy. Does ATP store a whole lot of energy? No, no just a little bit. Compared to the energy stored in a molecule of glucose, ATP stores much less energy. And so we will learn in the next chapter just how much ATP you can make from breaking down glucose. But now when I say break down glucose, we're really talking about breaking what? the chemical bonds between the carbons, the hydrogens, and the oxygens. That's what breaking down means. Breaking the chemical bonds between the molecules. And anytime you break a chemical bond, you release energy. energy. Everybody, every time you break a chemical bond, you release energy. energy. Oh my God, oh, that's so terrible. Oh, we're in a food coma because we eat nothing but empty carbohydrates at lunch. So now, period five and period six, the next thing you would do, you finished your notes here on 8-1. I want you to start on copying down your notes for 8-2. So if you have your phones, you can do that very easily. If you don't have your phones, I, if you already have a computer fired up, that's fine. Well, we only have like three minutes. I don't know how much time six periods gonna have. If you if you have your um, we have only like three or four minutes left. If you have your phones out, you could just log into the Google Classroom and start looking at it, or you can copy it from here. I'll get you started here. Okay, so a dash two is called photosynthesis and overview. And there's a little video here that the um, sub can show. Watch the video. We'll watch it tomorrow, and then you'll start there.